across the UK, online and on DAB. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Listen up, comrades of the world. Unite! He's a weapon of mass discussion and he's back on your radio. Get ready for a revolutionary rumble on your radio with the original George of the political jungle. Galloway, celebrate the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Come have a go if you think you're hard enough. Get it? On the radio station that gives power to the people. Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. 0844-499-1000. That's the number to call. Write it down because I don't want to have to keep saying it every five minutes. 844 499 1000 to join the great debate, the University of the Airwaves. Although I never went to university and I've got strong views about grammar schools, as you're about to find out, and so is the hapless sap who's going to turn up to debate it with me. It's the mother of all talk shows. Call me, have a go if you think you're hard enough. Get it? The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. I'm not even going to mention Wally, even though we've yet again tried to get him and yet again he's unavailable because he is dead in the water. That is surely the conclusion that anyone who watched the special edition of Question Time last night, anybody who votes for Owen Smith, I think that's his name, his proper name, Owen Smith is not fit to challenge Jeremy Corbyn for the Labour leadership. And I don't believe that any amount of rigging, and my goodness, has there been plenty of that, is going to deprive Corbyn of a substantial victory in just a few weeks' time. But do keep voting if you've been lucky enough to survive Purge 1 and Purge 2. In any case, I've got more important things to talk about. Grammar schools constitute class war. And Theresa May's answer to the problems of 2016, it turns out, is a return to the 1950s. The 1950s when sheep were separated from goats at the age of 11 by the device of an 11 plus examination. Fail it, and you were destined for a teenage and further lifetime of drudgery and repetition. Pass it, and you could become one of the elite, able to go on to the aforementioned universities. We won't stand for it, you know, Mrs. May. Neither parents nor teachers, nor many of your own honourable colleagues, two of whom, two already senior conservative politicians, both women, have explicitly rejected your idea. Labour is opposed. Liberals are opposed. Nationalists are opposed. Anybody with any sense is opposed to going back to the future. Look, the idea that the existing divisions and inequalities in our society will be healed or bettered by adding to them at the age of 11 surely doesn't bear any kind of examination. And I don't believe that it will pass the House of Commons. I don't believe it has any chance of passing the House of Lords. And I'm questioning her sanity. She's got a wafer-thin majority in Parliament, and she has launched a policy that even Mrs. Thatcher balked at. So is this an effort to be Maggie May, or is it some kind of device to distract, divert uh, the attention of her own parliamentary party away from their potentially fatal schism? Still, over the question of Brexit. 
uh, we'll be discussing in the course of the show with Chris McGovern, chairman of the Campaign for Real Education, who I understand is a supporter of grammar schools, and uh, I look forward to that. I hope he does as well. We'll be talking about the anniversary of the Blitz. 58 nights consecutive, London was burning. Eight months, one week, and three days. The rest of the country, as well as London, was burning. Almost 200,000 people were either killed or wounded in the Blitz. Very few people ever talk about that, even remember that. Almost 200,000. Whole streets were cleared. Factories, workshops, railway infrastructure, even Parliament itself was partially destroyed in that blitz. And yet we never surrendered. We never surrendered because we are or were a great people who were determined to stand up to Hitler, fascism, even when we were left doing so alone. When European governments, like the government in the Netherlands, threw up their hands in surrender, when the French surrendered, when the Americans were watching the war on newsreel, and when the Soviet Union, having tried and tried and tried again to put together a coalition of Western countries with themselves to thwart Hitlerism, when all that had been rebuffed, the Soviet Union made a separate deal with Hitler and sat out the early part of the war. Therefore, during that blitz, we were entirely alone. And inside the cabinet room, and inside the parliament, and inside the palace, and inside the city, and inside some of the country's then great newspapers, there were people, many people, who were willing Hitler to win. There were others who assumed that there was no other outcome possible, but one man, one man in the British political firmament said, we will never surrender. He told his cabinet colleagues that not until he and they lay on the floor of the cabinet room, choking in their own blood, would we succumb to the hordes, the barbaric hordes of Hitler fascism. And he meant it, by the way. Now, Hitler committed great crimes and great sins and is correctly damned for all history for what he did. Churchill, although he also committed crimes, he was also guilty of sin and also guilty of blunder should be remembered by everyone for all time as the man who saved this country from defeat. And if he had not come to power when he did, I'd be talking to you now in German. Although, of course, somebody like me would have long ago been consigned to the concentration camps or even worse. But... There's a lot of people in this country think Churchill is the name of the dog that advertises the motor car insurance. I don't know what it is about this trend of don't mention the war in Britain. It was our finest hour, and Churchill was our finest man. I'll be talking to Lord Alan Watson, former president of the Liberal Democrats, four times a parliamentary candidate, but now in the Lords, a master of history at Cambridge University and the author of a new book on the two speeches that Churchill made after losing to Labour in 1945, which arguably changed the course of history again. And Lord Watson will be coming up on the show in the second hour. We'll also be talking about North Korea. Now, I'm listening to the media knocking their knees together 
and working themselves up into a lather that a crazy government seems to have got its hands on sufficient technology to have a nuclear weapon of formidable proportions. And I'm against it. I'm against crazy governments having nuclear weapons of Earth global ending proportions. But North Korea is not the only crazy government with a nuclear bomb. I don't know what law of logic is followed by arguing that the United States, led, for example, by George Bush or Donald Trump, can safely be allowed to have thousands of nuclear weapons, but bar me, Kim Jong-un in North Korea cannot have one. I want all of them taken away. I want all of them destroyed. That, I suspect, will be the difference between me and the Korean expert Aidan Foster Carter. Honorary Senior Research Fellow in Sociology and Modern Korea of Leeds University, who will be with me in the third hour. It's all coming up on the mother of all talk shows. Back at grammar school, perhaps. Maggie May, otherwise known as our unelected Prime Minister, has decided to go back to the future to challenge the problems of 2016 by going back to 1956. Grammar schools, selection, viability, of course, purchased ability through tutors, for the most part, by the age of 11. You'll be a sheep, or you'll be a goat. That's at least what Theresa May imagines. Chris McGovern, full marks to him, is the chairman of the Campaign for Real Education. And he's going to debate that with me right now. Chris, go ahead. Well, you know, we've had um, comprehensive schools for about 50 years. And um, according to the international league tables in terms of social mobility the UK is at the bottom so comprehensive schools are set up to increase social mobility to put us at the bottom of the international league tables but we are top of the international league tables for illiteracy and innumeracy so we do need to do something about education and what so we are, uh, we're an illiterate and innumerate nation is that what you're saying? well according to the OECD the the international statisticians, if you like, United Nations, what they're saying is that um, we're the only country in the developed world where grandparents outperform their grandchildren in literacy and numeracy, and we're bottom for literacy and we're second bottom for numeracy. So internationally, on international levels, we are doing really badly, and a lot of kids are being let down. And this is really an indictment of what's been going on. Not to say that you can't have good comprehensive schools. There are good comprehensive schools around the country. If you can buy into the catchment area, you get to go to them. And there are good, catch the good comprehensive schools abroad. I mean, you can go to China. They have a comprehensive system, and it's very good. They have a very high standard, and they are very rigorous. The problem is, in this country, we're not teaching children in line with their ability. And academically gifted children, able children... I think they need to be given a fair crack of the whip. They need to be taught in line with their ability. Now, the so, that, so that they can get even further ahead of the rest. The, well, the, yeah, goats, I mean, the goats leaping right, further yeah. ahead of the sheep. Is that yeah, what you've got in mind? Go as far ahead as they can, because they can then generate some you know, wealth for the country. Well, but the country... Like, now, let me stop you there, because you've just painted a picture of an innumerate, illiterate, failing Britain. Yeah. Odd, oddly, we are the fifth richest economy in the entire world. How have we managed that? 
Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because the older generation, the generation who were educated in secondary modern schools, like myself, by the way, secondary modern school boy, uh, we, we uh, this 50s and 60-year-old generation, we're near the top of the world in academic standards. So it's not as though the older generation are left in the country down. They've done very well, and we are where we are today because the older generation were indeed educated very well. Chris, we've we're been the... Chris, the Chris, Chris, we've been the fifth or sixth richest economy in the world for 30 years. Not your father's generation, for 30 years. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely great, isn't it? And that's because the people who are in power, if you like, in the country are indeed a generation educated 20, 30, 40 years ago. No, I'm asking you why we became so rich. If our people became... are so stupid, so undereducated, so illiterate, so innumerate, how come we've done so well? Well, because what, what we're really saying is that that wasn't always the case. I'm saying that if you go back to the 50s and 60s, we actually were one of the best educated countries in the world. And we're the only country in the world where grandparents of the 50s and 60s generation outperformed their grandchildren. So we did actually very well in those days. All right. Let, let, let's agree to park our disagreement on this. How is social mobility going to be assisted by making uh, a return to the era of selection, 11 plus, grammar schools and the drudges in secondary modern. How is that going to assist social mobility? Well, first of all, as I say, we're bottom of the International League table for social mobility. You can't get any lower than that. So anything we do is going to be better. What we're advocating in the campaign for re-education is that for every new grammar school that is introduced alongside it, and better resourced, in fact, should be a gold standard uh, technical vocational school. Well, why don't we make it double gold? Why don't we make it diamond? Why, why, why don't we make every school a gold standard school? Why, yeah, do you, why do you want to make some schools special, inevitably leading? For all that rhetoric you've just said about okay. gold standards, okay, well, inevitably well. leaving the, the bog standard secondary modern to, to simply limp along. The thing is, you know, when we introduced comprehensive schools, we also, we also got rid of the academic exam. We have, a, we have a, a comprehensive school system, mixed ability, and we have a mixed ability exam. It's the GCSE, which everybody passes. We used to have something called the O-level. We still actually produce O-levels. We sell it to our economic competitors like Singapore. We're banished in our own country. The problem with our comprehensive school system, it doesn't function very well, partly because of the methods we use for teaching and the exam system we've employed. The, the, theoretically, you could have a grammar school education within the comprehensive system, so you'd have a bilateral system, so that the kids who are ap academically able, they would be stretched, but also the kids, don't forget, we mustn't get, we must get away from this snobbery that somehow academic grammar is superior to vocational. We think that Isambard Kingdom Brunel was equally valid as a, as, as a hero of our, of our nation as Charles Dickens. There's no problem. I, we, if we can have great academic schools and great vocational schools along Side them and put more resources into the vocational schools because they'll need more resources. We can be fair to everybody, and we should do it at 13 or 14, not at, not at 11. It's probably too early. Well, you say probably too early. That was, of course, the separation of sheep from goats uh, for uh, for the best part of 100 years in this country. There's no proposal that I know of to defer the separation uh, of winners and losers uh, any later than 11. But I'm against it on principle because I know because I was there when some people took a path which ineluctably led to a rounder education and university and other children took a path that ineluctably led to drudgery in a factory. Not Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who, by the way, was educated at a private school and at one of our top universities, but drudgery, assembly line work, cleaning, digging holes. That's what the other path led to, not to... Uh, engineering excellence because it was the kids that took the path to perfection that did the engineering excellence. Well, yeah, it's interesting what you're saying. Of course, we, what we're really saying is that we should 
have uh, a system which is meritocratic so that people, young people, should uh, get go into the employment areas for which they're best suited. Now, I, I've done all sorts of jobs in my life, and I've, I've been to secondary and modern school as well, and I recognize what you're saying. Of course, a lot of people's jobs can seem drudgery to us, but not necessarily drudgery to people who are doing the jobs, of course, because my father worked on the factory floor for 35 years. So did mine, and, and, and believe me, drudgery was, was, was the middle the name. They're quite proud of the fact they dug coal for 35 years. We mustn't demean people because they do meet... I'm not demeaning them. I'm standing up for them. It's no, you. Sorry. It's you who wants to leave them on the scrap heap of no, no, drudgery. No, 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 I'm not demeaning them. I'm championing them. Okay, I thought you would demean them. I think, I think you know, you mustn't put down people who are doing these jobs. We mustn't put down people who are doing jobs, which they may well enjoy. We don't want, we want people to be suited to the jobs. Chris, nobody enjoys drudgery. Some have to endure it in you order to stay drudgery. alive. Look, Look, what I'm telling, what I'm saying drudgery. to you is... People don't find it drudgery. You know, it's, 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 it's really depending on the person. I'm sure you would find things, certain things drudgery, so would I. But other people don't necessarily find it drudgery. I would find it really hard, perhaps, to be... A, to be a surgeon because I don't know anything about the job people like to do a job which they can feel they can do well you know and sometimes people can do what can be a highly qualified job well others can't do the highly qualified job well but they want to earn a living and they want to do something which you might consider to be drudgery it's not drudgery to work in a coal mine if you want to do that job that's uh, what, uh, would, chance would be a fine thing except yeah, Mrs. Thatcher be, closed yeah, them agree, all agree but, on that one. But, but Chris Chris yeah. the, if this is such a good idea yeah why did a succession of Labour and Conservative governments, including the aforementioned Mrs. Thatcher, not do it. Well, this, the point is, you know, that what actually happened is that in the 1970s, I suppose, the uh, the educational world, the educational establishment, we called it, really took control of the situation. Margaret Thatcher can actually closed more grammar schools than anybody else. I don't think it was in her instincts to do that. I think she would like to have kept them open. But local authorities, whom she was dealing with, were indeed taken over by people who have your opinion and thought they were they were they were iniquitous and they were. So she smashed the minors, but <laughs> but faded. Uh, the possibility of some social democrat in an education authority somewhere. I come on, you, come on, Chris, you're pulling my leg. She yeah. she didn't do it because she knew that it cut across the grain of the opinion of the great majority of people. And this is my last point to you, if I may. Yeah. The, how can this get through? A good number of Tories are against it. They've only got a majority of 12. They have no majority in the Lords. It's not going to go through, is it? I'll tell you something. You, we've got a situation where we've got the lowest social mobility in the world. We've got a disastrous situation. Only the bright kids, sorry, only the well-off kids going to private school and those who can afford to buy homes next to good schools are getting a good education. And you're absolutely right. They haven't got a hope in hell. The series of May, like everybody else who's confronted the educational establishment, is going to be beaten. And the kids from ordinary working class backgrounds are going to stay in the sink where they are. We need to do something to help them. You and I need to get together because I know we're different in many ways, but we want to help kids from inner city areas like myself. Okay, Chris McGovern, thanks for coming on. As I say, top marks to you for showing up. Chairman of the Campaign for Real Education. What do you think? 0844 499 1000. 0844 499 1000. He's a weapon of mass discussion, and he's back on your radio. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Now, coming in the next hour, we talk to a specialist in counter-terrorism about how we've managed to avoid a terrorist attack in this country in recent years following a number of arrests this week. Also, the best of Ian Lee is coming up at 10 p.m. And tomorrow morning from 8 a.m., Penny Smith catches you up on the news stories you might have missed this week. Amy Schindler is in to talk about her new play, Burning Bridges. And Penny talks to author Louise Candlish. All that is from 8 a.m. and only on talk radio. 0844 499 1000 is the number. If you want to call me, you can email me or you can uh, text me. You can tweet me.
at George Galloway or at Talk Radio, as a very large number of you have done. Somebody resounding in the Twitter name, The Duke, says, Is there no way of ridding us of these Tories? Grammar schools, it's code for another form of elitism. And Thomas, Mr. Tom, says, Maybe good to take us back. Conservatives are the only party with a backbone. And it shows in PM's questions. Fido Bulks says Wally's own CLP is backing Jezza. Just proves what a Trojan horse Wally really is. This is a report that actually by more than two to one, uh, the members of Wally's own constituency Labour Party are actually supporting Jeremy Corbyn. And Farla Hines says, why is there never any discussion about the majority of population in this country who were not anti-German. Well, none of us were anti-German, Farla. We were just anti-Nazi. Uh, Norma is on the line from Bristol on the grammar schools. Norma, my blood's boiling at this. Where do you stand? <laughs> oh, well, I just think it's... I don't like this idea that because kids come from poor working class families, they can't do well. I mean, I've got three granddaughters growing up now One's just got a first-class degree from Buckingham University. The other one is working part-time on a degree. And the other one's going to become a nurse. They went to an ordinary comprehensive school. Their father's a bus conductor, bus driver. And um, they they really, they've got two-bedroom house. And it's a comprehensive school. And they worked hard. And I just think I, this sort of feeling that, oh, dear, I know there are problems, but I just sort of think I'm so proud of the situation that my family were in and what they've done and an ordinary comprehensive education. So I just wanted to say that, really. Well, you've said it very well. My father was a factory worker, an assembly line worker. My mother worked in a fish cannery, and I grew up to be a presenter on talk <laughs> sport. <laughs> but the point is, Norma, whatever problems we've got with uh, numeracy, literacy, whatever problems we've got with social mobility will not be improved by going back to the 1950s, no. by giving a small number of children a super duper education, whilst the others lag behind in so-called vocational streams. Yep. Am I right? Well, you are, yes. I mean, I have got another theory, but it's um, probably haven't got time to give it to of you. Of course really. I do. Of course I do. Well, you probably won't agree with me. Um, I think comprehensives, uh, by and large, are quite good if you work hard and you've got a bit of discipline. And, and if you haven't got that ability, well, you know, it's nothing wrong with that. But there is a section of people who are extremely clever. And I think that, I don't know, 5 6% should be streamed off to do what they can with the big things in life that we need. No, like that, big... that, that, that's the elitist uh, system that we had in this country for a very, very long time. Norma, thanks for calling. Let's go to Fraser in Bolton. Go ahead, Fraser. Good evening, George. Good evening to you. Are you uh, first of all, I'd like say I enjoyed very much your uh, Winston Churchill bit earlier because I know how much of a, a big uh, your love and uh, devotion to Winston Churchill is, which I always like to throw in the face of, shall we say, the Edmiston Drive Brigade. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes, yes. But I thought when it was about the 11 plus thing. Now, the key in that is the 11. It, this is insane. You, you're asking children aged, you know. Yeah, know, starting to, from 10. To, so to some, some exam. kids will be preparing for an exam whilst they are 10, which will decide the rest of their lives. Well, I've got an 11-year-old son, and the idea of that having taken place in the last year is frankly insane and ludicrous and I'd, I would, you know I've, as you know George, uh, I received your DVD and it was absolutely fabulous Oh I'm glad you liked it yes, glad yes, you liked it. it was fantastic and um, in the same package I also produced uh, also, I didn't produce, I got Michael Moore's uh, film Where Shall We Invade Next uh, yeah, I've not seen that yet, is it good? I, I thoroughly recommend it okay. um, and one of the things he takes back to America only he didn't uh, was the education system in Finland which ev 
every school, every school, doesn't matter which neighbourhood they are, has the same amount of equipment, the same amount of space, the same teachers on the same salaries, and it's completely open. The private education is banned. So everybody has to mix with each other. Yeah. So the rich, the children of the rich decision makers get to meet, you know, over the factory workers. Exactly. It creates a better society. But also, what happens in the secondary school stream is um, they start to identify as what happens in real life about the age of 14 and 15, what people's, you know, natural slants towards are. And they have get tailored classes for them. Yeah. It's common sense. There's nothing wrong with that. And every, everybody at the same school, let's make every school a grammar school. I would, that's, that, you, that was, you, well, you're the bright guy. You took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly what the point he was making was the government said, well, there'll be no private schools. Hmm. Everybody goes to the same school. And every school, doesn't matter where you are, has the same class size, teacher budget, supplies budget, everything. Exactly. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not rocket science. No. If, if our teachers were better looked after, better motivated, were less burdened by bureaucracy and task after task being lumped on them, if our children all got the same amount of money spent on them as the children at a grammar school or even better at a private school do, uh, then... Our outcomes would be would be much better. I don't hate private schools. I go to speak at them all the time, and I can see uh, the, what the parents are getting for their money. The teachers are paid much more. Each kid has a spend, uh, an average spend on them, which is much more. They've got better yep. facilities, better playing fields. I'm not against these private schools. I want every school to be like that. That's that's it's common sense. You invest. It. How many times do we hear we invest in the future? You're not investing in the future. No. With advice of education policies. You're that's absolutely fact. right. Fraser, thanks for calling, son. Good. To, I'm glad you liked the film. Uh, Fomey says I've never been prouder to be from Oldham than when watching the audience of Question Time blank Wally to take a selfie with Corbyn. It was uh, quite funny, I must say. I have to take a break for some capitalist messages, but let me give you this phone number. 0844-499-1000. Listen up, comrades of the world. Unite the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. We will, we will. 0844-499-1000. That's the number to call, as Richard in Leeds has just done, and he's on the air. Go ahead, Richard. Hi, George. Uh, massive fan. Thank you, mate. What do you think of the arguments about grammars? Um, well, I've been through both grammar and state school, um, and I can tell you I, I don't believe there's a massive difference in the teaching. Uh, the, the only difference I found was... Um, and the fact that uh, the grammar school had like a great swimming pool, things like that. Um, but the state school was was no different with teaching; just there was more more students. That's it. Well, that, of course, that's part of the problem, Richard. That the class sizes in the secondary moderns are bigger than they are in the grammars. But the most important difference, and I speak as one who experienced it, is that you have snob value. You have prestige value. You have elite value if you went to the grammar school. Therefore, you're more likely to get into the university. You're more likely to have your application plucked out and shortlisted than if you went to bog standard secondary modern dot com. Uh, and the prestige, the elitism that is in that system is precisely it's point, and it's precisely for those reasons that we should never go back to that, Rich. Right, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I agree with you on that. Um, I, I, I feel like more like the, um, the people in state school look down on me in a way because I'd gone to grammar school, um, as if I thought they were, that I was better than them. Yeah, um, well, well that, 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 that happened way. to me. We used to get stoned by the uh, other kids at the secondary mall. They used to throw stones at us, calling us snobs. Uh, but, of course, this was a cri de coeur from them, if I may say to somebody called Richard. This was... Yeah. Uh, this was a cry of pain from them because they knew that us with our fancy, fancy uniforms and caps were beginning a process that would leave them way, way behind. Okay, well, I, I wasn't, I wasn't better than them. 
Um, I, I understand they might have thought that, um, but I definitely, uh, I wasn't, I didn't grow up more uh, in a richer class. I was, I was middle class at best. Um, I just got lucky, basically, and there were, there were people at state school that were more well off than myself. Um, and I don't feel like I ever got um, uh, a help in later life because of where I went to uh, at my private school. Um, it, it, never, it never helped me in college. Uh, I never went to university, but um, I but don't feel like. Did it you ever say private school or grammar? Did you go to a private school? Uh, private school, grammar is the same. It was, um, yeah. No, a private school you pay for. Aye. Private schools are fee-paying schools. Grammar schools yeah. are not. Right. Okay. Oh dear, you didn't learn much at your private school. Well, obviously not, yeah. <laughs> Richard, thanks for calling. <laughs> All the best to you, son. Now, uh, Nuff said, uh, tweets, yeah, but George, tutors are much more affordable than mortgages near good schools. That's a fair point, Nuff said. That's a fair point. But that's why, instead of doing this, we have to do something different. I'm not arguing here for the status quo. We have an underfunded, underpowered, comprehensive education system. And we have an unacceptable gap between some comprehensive schools and other comprehensive schools. Thus, you get this cluster of people moving into houses near the best comprehensive schools. But there's no excuse for some comprehensive schools being so much better than other comprehensive schools. Now, there are special issues arise in areas uh, where there are high levels of poverty, where there are high levels of children uh, for whom English is a second language, where there are high levels of uh, numbers of children where English is not the main language being taught at home. But that needs more expenditure. That needs a special effort to bring those comprehensive schools up to the level of those uh, that Nuff said is talking about. Let's hear from Steve in Nuneaton. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, good evening, George. How are you? I'm great. It's wonderful to speak to you again. Thank you, my friend. Well, I think we've seen the next Prime Minister of this country, if you saw Question Time, last night. Oh, I thought, I thought, uh, I thought uh, Corbyn, was... Corbyn gave him a comprehensive drubbing, didn't you think? Yeah, but it's not only that, it's the way he interacted with the audience as well. I yeah. think he was, was pure, e excellent. pure class, pure class, yeah. It was it like, was, it was like um, football supporters of a certain age will recall, it was like watching Jim Baxter on the ball, strolling <laughs> through the opposition, playing keepy up. He, you, uh, he, he was a different class. It, it, totally different class. And if you can recall back to when he was going for the leadership in the first place, they had the big telephysos in, in the Neaton, which is just up the road from me, George, and he was exactly the same then. And that was with um, Yvette Cooper and Liz Kendall and all them. That was, up, was exactly up against a better class of opposition. Yeah, and he was exactly the same, George. Yeah. Exactly, pure class. And if you compare that to what you saw from Theresa May in Prime Minister's Questions this week, it just shows you the difference between the two. He's got to be our next prime minister. I think she's you know? very limited, you know. She's very, very limited. She's, and by the time the uh, general election comes in 2020, after things like this grammar school debacle and no doubt other problems in the economy and in Parliament and over Brexit and so on, she'll be an opponent that Corbyn can defeat. Very, very easily. I mean, to, I mean, you overlook at Prime Minister's questions this week, George. I mean, what did you get? He was asking about social housing. He, and and all, it was all laughed off by these privileged silver spoons. She pretty much avoided every question she yeah. was asked, yeah. reaching for a series of, like, cringe-worthy, weak, pre-written put-downs. She's not even very good. She's not even very good. She's, no. I mean, she needs a new script writer. She, she needs more than that, George, I think. I, I, I think she's very, very weak in, in that regard. And as you know, and this with the grammar schools, George, 
I mean, what are you going to get if you have that? And do you think that's got anything to do with covering up with this pressure for Brexit? Do you think I, I, this I think it's some... a diversion. It's, uh, well, uh, it may not be, but uh, it seems to me such a, a suicide mission uh, that I can't think of a better explanation for it. Uh, it yeah, can't go what, through, uh, yeah. Steve. It, she cannot get it through Parliament, neither House. She's, I mean, the way they're talking is if they've got a massive majority or something, it's not going to happen to They've got a majority of 12, and I could name you right now at least 20 Tory MPs that will not vote for it. So it's a dead duck. Yeah, absolutely a dead duck, yeah. It's, Steve, it's just... thanks for calling my friend, oh, Stephen Nuneaton, uh, a good friend of the show, Alan Budd. Uh, writes in via Twitter, why change the education system again? Leave it alone and get on with sorting Brexit. That's, you know, the point. We've had reorganization after reorganization. We've had reorganization of the education system, of the health service. But what we haven't had is enough financial investment in the education service or, for that matter, in the uh, health service. Steve Keery raises a good point on Twitter. Does Mrs. May have a mandate to carry this through? And of course she does not. As was pointed out by Baroness Smith, the Labour leader in the House of Lords this very afternoon, this was not in the Tory manifesto. It represents, by anybody's standards, a major, major U-turn in the life of our youngest people, and there is no mandate for it. Not a vote was cast for it. Now, that's quite a serious constitutional matter. And the House of Lords, at the very least, if not the House of Commons, will take a very dim view of that, I believe. Let me go on with more uh, tweets. Lizzie says, absolutely, quote, we will make room for poorer children, unquote, equals admitting that grammar schools inherently favour the better off. That's absolutely correct. Well said. Now, Nuff said says, who does the drudgery? Do we not need drudgery anymore? Yes, of course we do. Although, frankly, by the middle of this century, which is not that long distant, most of the drudgery will be done by artificial intelligence. The rest of us will be writing and reading poetry. I hope if we get the right kind of society by then. Timmy the dog says, social mobility is a function of social equality. Britain has poor social mobility because it has great inequality. Very well said, Timmy. And of course, that is the point. We live in a grotesquely unequal society. And the numbers of people who move from the poor, from the ordinary working class people into making it big in academia or politics or uh, or uh, banking or the law and so on is far, far too small, as any fool knoweth. John Joe says, the schools don't really matter. It's the effort that the students put in, although school is a factor, not big. Well, I'm with you uh, up to a point, John Joe. I mean, uh, I speak as a father of many children, by the grace of God, and I believe that it's the atmosphere at home, the inculcation of learning for its own sake, of reading, of searching for knowledge and beauty and truth. That has to start at the home in the family. And uh, if you inculcate your children with that, then they'll survive much uh, in the school system and go on to do well. That is, after all, what happened to uh, me. I grew up in a house where no middle class or private school educated child could have been in a more inquiring, inquisitive environment. Whenever I asked my parents, anything at all. They told me, look it up in your encyclopedia. And they had bought me a volume from a traveling salesman door to door. Arthur Mee, I remember them well. Arthur Mee's encyclopedia. Dark, red, wine-colored, 
uh, books and they'd stand over me while I looked it up in the encyclopedia. Now, Google is much quicker than that, but I'm not sure that the Googled information stays in your mind quite as long. Let me take one more tweet before the break. Uh, David says, George, the fact that Maggie is pushing grammar schools is enough for me. I remember the 11 plus. No going back. Well, uh, time for one more. Lizzie Fletcher. I went to grammar school and loved it, but my sister and brothers who didn't pass the 11 plus are still upset with me now. That's a very good point, you know, that you're leaving children behind. We should be striving for a society where no child is left behind, where no one is left behind, where everyone does the best that they can and helps through the taxation system and in many other ways those who are not able to keep up. That's the definition of a society, isn't it? It's certainly a definition of the society for which I myself have striven all of my life. This is the mother of all talk shows. I'm George Galloway, and this, of course, is Talk Radio. Here for another two hours, I am. Across the UK, online and on DAB. A radio star is born. You're going to love Talk Radio. Talk Radio. What's not to love? Talk Radio, the mother of all talk shows. 0844-499-1000. That's the number to call. We're discussing grammars. We're discussing terrorism. We're discussing Churchill and Corbyn and Trump. Across the UK, online and on DAV. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. On Talk Radio, we'll get you talking. Listen up, comrades of the world. Unite. He's a weapon of mass discussion and he's back on your radio. Get ready for a revolutionary rumble on your radio with the original George of the political jungle. Galloway, celebrate. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Call me, have a go if you think you're hard enough. Get it? On the radio station that gives power to the people. Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. 0844-499-1000. That's the number to call. We'll be talking about terrorism and the dangers our country face from bombers and other terrorist acts. And the police are doing a wonderful job. But will it be enough to keep us safe? Have a go if you think you're hard enough. Get it? The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. On Talk Radio, we'll get you talking. Every single day, the police are arresting someone in Britain on terror-related charges. It has been a long time since a successful terrorist operation was mounted here. Our police are doing a great job. Our counter-terrorism police are, I believe, at the cutting edge of such counter-terrorism in the world. We're helped, of course, by being an island. It's not so easy for the ill-intentioned to cross our borders, though that, of course, does not save us from those who've been born or are living already within our own borders who wish to harm innocent people for political purposes, which is the definition of terrorism or ought to be. The intelligence services, now greatly inflated in size and their budget commensurately increased, are also doing a good job, but they could do better, in my opinion. Sometimes they do things that increase the danger of terrorism rather than reduce that danger. Uh, there's no doubt that there are people out to hurt us. I argued as just one of the reasons why our policy objectively of encouraging people from all over the world to go and fight and make jihad in Syria as we had done in the 1980s in Afghanistan was a policy that was doomed 
to disaster, because if these people succeeded, then a long dark night would descend upon the country in which they had succeeded, and if they failed, well, they'd all be dressed up with nowhere to go. And I was once, fortuitously for me, though not for him, trapped in a lift with William Hague. Imagine how he felt as the lift shuddered to a halt with just me and him in it. And I told him, William, you've been wrong before. In fact, you've been wrong all your life, but you've never been insane before. But your policy of arming terrorism in Syria and creating a climate in which radicalized, extremized Muslims in Britain and elsewhere will head there to fight is a disastrously insane policy. Anyway, we remain in a state of very high alert. A terrorist attack is virtually certain, say those tasked with looking after us. And each time we thwart one of these terrorist plots, then the chances are we've gotten off uh, just in time, which doesn't mean that the police are necessarily going to catch the next cell of fanatics who are determined to wreak havoc amongst our people. So let's talk to a specialist in counter-terrorism, Simon Trundle, and ask him, how have we been able to get by so far without a major attack? Simon, thanks for joining us. Good evening, George. What would be the answer to that question? I think a mixture of luck, good fortune, and um, a very concentrated intelligence campaign to try and identify individuals who are radicalised. But as Sir Bernard Hogan Howe said recently, we will not get all of them. We will not detect all of them in advance. And therefore, a lot of work has gone into preparing for what we'll do immediately after an attack. Do you think it's, uh, is it sufficient, the work that's been done for what would happen after, in your view? I think a lot of the work um, where they've done uh, multi-agency training and exercises is, is uh, very, very much better than it, than it was, shall we say, in the 90s. Um, now we've got regular exercising with the police and fire and ambulance and support services so that, uh, you know, uh, resources are on site. Of course, it does depend on where the terrorist attack is. People will fall into the idea that it'll be London or possibly Manchester or Birmingham, but what if it's Norfolk, which is a bit further geographically from other places? What if it's a, a smaller rural town, uh, you know, a, a farmer's market? Then naturally we're, we're going to be pushed to try and get resources there. Are we looking at the... Uh special danger of what we might call the Bombay style of attack, uh, of seizing somewhere, telegenic or iconic, and uh, trying to hold hostages there, trying to hold out there, drawing the cameras and the media's attention across the world. Is that the most likely uh, kind of danger, or some lone wolf type of primitive uh, attack with uh, with a knife uh, or, or or with uh, with blunt instruments, Wh which in, on that range, Simon, are the most likely dangers? The the impossible task that the police and security services and everybody else have is that you cannot rank either of those potentially as one higher than the other because you could say you could look at Kenya and say look at what happened in the Nairobi shopping centre. Um, armed multiple attackers marauding through a shopping centre for hours, um, shooting people who were either found hiding, initially killing a lot of people. And then you go back to somebody in France, uh, a lone individual who targets and identifies two members of the police, a man and woman, um, and attacks them and kills them in a home with nothing more than a knife. So we can't actually sit there and go, I think the knife is more is more likely to happen. Yes, you can get hold of a knife much easier. You can go to B&Q or any other store and just buy one. Um, getting hold of weapons, a little more difficult, a lot more difficult, but not impossible. So we could be looking at a lone active shooter, at somebody who's got a shotgun, somebody's got a gun who will do it, 
Uh, and, but as soon as you take it from that up to a, a group of people who are planning an assault on a major shopping centre and trying to hold it and contain it for a period of time, then that's a bigger operation and potentially could be detected with the security resource we have. But the ones we cannot really detect and have extreme difficulty in detecting without some community-led intelligence is the lone individual who has decided to pledge their loyalty and carry out an attack at the first opportunity. It's a vindication of our uh, our anti-gun culture uh, in this country, isn't it? Because, of course, uh, terrible damage can be done uh, by someone with a knife or even with a shotgun. But with a shotgun, you've only got two shots. Uh, with a knife, you can be overwhelmed by others. But in countries uh, on the European mainland, in North America, where the presence of automatic weapons uh, in huge, gigantic, undream un undreamable numbers, uh, the possibility of terrorist carnage is much greater, isn't it? It is. Um, I mean, we mustn't be too complacent because we do know that from evidence of some of the drug-related deaths um, and gang-on-gang -gang deaths in London that... You know, and in other cities that uh, automatic machine pistols have appeared, that other weapons have appeared, but thankfully they're the rarity. Um, it, it, you can imagine, as you said, in a country where somebody like in America, where the Latin Alanda was able to buy two weapons, buy hundreds of rounds of ammunition, um, you know, they, they had the wherewithal. Um, on, on France, they smuggled the weapons in. They believe, and they held them there, and they were brought, probably brought in from Eastern Europe. They were brought in Romania. They, they suspect that um, here in the UK, it, it just goes to show we have to be very vigilant at ports um, and at airport. Well, not at airports because I don't think you'd be able to easily smuggle weapons aboard, but on port, ports uh, and boats and small boats landing, and that's where a stream of the whole safety of the country is actually going to fall back on the members of the public. Uh, and you'll see these campaigns coming out saying uh, coastal watch. If you're a regular walker on the coast and you see a boat landing late at night or you see something suspicious, phone the police, let them know. If you if you hear of an attack happening, run, hide, tell, don't become, don't go towards the noise, get away from it as quickly as possible. And now you're looking at, at major retail networks or, 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 or locations asking me for advice saying how could we cope with a marauding armed attacker when on Saturday this this Saturday coming we'll have 40 to 50,000 people on our premises what's the best that we can do to to try and get them out and that's that's training staff in evacuation and making sure all the entrances are clear making sure people can find their way to entrances so there's a whole lot that we need people to do in support of what the police security services and others can do you you raise uh, a question uh, that I think uh, will be occurring to uh, some of the, uh, the audience this evening. Do we have the numbers of people? Uh, I mean, you mentioned police, fire and ambulance. I don't know about the ambulance, except I know there's a lot of demotivation, de de demoralization amongst many health service personnel. Uh, but I know that fire stations and fire engines and firemen have been relentlessly cut back and cut back. Do we have enough people at the ports? Do we have enough customs officers? Do we have enough coast guards? Uh, I, I think the answer to most of those questions is in the negative, Simon. It is, absolutely, and, and that's why in recent months, George, you'll have seen a series of articles, whether it was the head of a, a border, um, you know, border of a custom saying, we need more officers, we need vastly more individuals on the ground, we need more specially trained to search vehicles, etc. Uh, and the same applies all the way across the emergency services. You know, we, we, with, with cutbacks and centralization of ambulance resources and call-out points rather than having local ambulances and, and staging amb ambulances along points on the motorway where they can be sent north, south, send, sort of north, south, east or west at short notice is, is, is a good way of looking at it from a financial perspective. You know, if somebody wants to cut, cut, cut and cut, but eventually you reach the point where you do an exercise and you realize that when you do the exercise that there is no way that you can provide the resources for a multiple incident, so let alone for one. If we have one, it'll be difficult to, to meet one major event with all the resources. That'll be difficult enough. But what if we have 
somebody planning to do multiple events all at the same time, similar to Paris, exactly the same as Paris, where you had the Stade de France, then you had a marauding uh, armed uh, attack on restaurants and bars, and then you had the nightclub. They drew people uh, and resources away incredibly fast. And therefore, we have to keep on adding resources and exercises to say, if this happens, uh, if we've all committed to event number one, how do we respond to event number two? We have to keep back reserves. And I think it's inevitable that the some of the cuts and some of the plans that said a number of years ago, you know, we can, we can survive in normal circumstances with this number of people, but they have to be reversed, some of them. And there is already recruitment for more armed, uh, armed officers in the in Metropolitan Police and across the country. Um, there's more recruitment for border force. But this all takes time. You don't just re- recruit somebody and they're instantly trained. It's going to take us a couple of years to get up to a, a, fo- a better level than we are at the moment. And I think at the moment, the resources we have, they're working incredibly well, George. They, they, you know, and I know about the demoralization among the um, paramedics. Uh, my, my son-in-law is a paramedic. I, I know about the working yeah. times in the ships. But, he was, but his attitude is if something bad happens, I'll be there. Of course. If, you know, if I'm in leave, I'll be there. And I think the same happens with fire and emergency. And look what happens when we call for people to get blood and members of the public come. So I think there will be a general call out to all medical, paramedic, fire, police, you know, you're off leave, you're back in, let's let's solve this together. And I think that's the way we'll have to respond. Simon Trundle, a specialist in counterterrorism, thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. 0844 499 1000. What do you think about what you've heard so far? Uh, later in the second half of this hour, we'll be talking about a man who had to deal with a terrorist attack on an unimaginable level. The Blitz and the Nazi aggression against uh, the whole world in the Second World War. We'll be talking to Lord Alan Watson, Lib Dem Lord and author of Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World, 0844 499 1000. Controversial conversation and cutting edge current affairs comment with the notorious B I G G, the mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway on Talk Radio. Listen, this guy's a nightmare. He's not a great guy, folks. You're getting a later Trump, okay? I'm George Galloway. This is the mother of all talk shows, of course, on Talk Radio every Friday night between seven and ten. My number is oh eight four 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 nine nine one thousand, and if you call that. You could be on the air, just like Laura in central London. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for taking my call. Um, if I may talk about um, Theresa May and um, Clinton. Um, with Theresa May, I just find it incredible that the daughter of a vic- vicar, um, her father worked in, uh, was the vicar or something clergy of a hospital as well. So he must have seen how um, having a poorer, living a poorer life affects your quality of life um, and that of your family. But I think when she came into power, didn't she say that she wanted a more equal Britain, a more yes, fairer Britain? Yes. Um, but grammar schools won't create a fairer Britain and as you said George why why isn't every school a grammar school exactly I mean isn't that the isn't that the target that we should be aiming at that's right and um, if you come from a family uh, where there are a number of children and all of them go to grammar school bar one what would that one child be subjected to by the other siblings the mocking the taunting um the inequality that you know the bullying of course, that would I mean, happen there is absolutely no doubt about that that you are if you go to the secondary modern then there are many in society who regard you as the hewers of wood and the drawers of water, and that the children who go to the grammar school are the leaders and the innovators and the scientists and the That's right. the, the the top notchers uh, uh, of the society in the future. How can that be a good thing? Yeah, and they are groomed to be confident and to know that they're going to go places in their life. Exactly. Um, 
Right. About Clinton, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a few days ago, she actually, in one of her speeches, said that, um, well, she was alleging that Russia hacked the DNC emails. Yes. You know, and that it was Russia that gave them to WikiLeaks. Um, so she's made that allegation. And in the same speech, she said that if she gets into power or when she gets into power, any country that she deems um, has been hacking America or the American government or whatever, uh, she'll um, use military action. In other words, she'll go to war against Russia and any other country that she thinks has hacked them. Yeah, uh, this is why I, I describe this contest as being between Godzilla 1 and Godzilla 2. That's right. There, there, there is no doubt at all that she is a... Dangerous. She's a da armed and dangerous person. Absolutely. I mean, George, tell me, how many wars would she be content with? Because we've already got a few going on. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And let's, let's pick a, let's start a war with Russia. At least Ronald Reagan was only joking when he said it. Most people are afraid that Hillary Clinton is not joking. No, she's not joking. And um, I don't know if you know, but she and Obama have been um, promoting fracking globally uh, with the corporations, the fracking corporations, even though they know that several communities across America have, have had their water poisoned yep. by fracking. So their communities are dying slowly of chronic illness and they can't even afford to pay for, for medical insurance. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, one of the new, uh, newly announced uh, Jeremy Corbyn policies of banning fracking will turn out to be a very popular policy indeed. Thanks for that, Laura. Let's go to Spencer in Chester on the grammar school issue. Spencer, welcome to the show. Hello, George. Um, I'd like to say a few hours ago, um, I would have agreed with you on grammar schools. But then since then, I've, I've heard the point that we already do have a kind of selective education in this country. It's house prices. Uh, I think London has the highest house prices and the highest standard of schooling. I think um, not the grammar schools that we had in the 1950s or in Northern Ireland. If we brought back a different type of grammar school where they had quotas, just, just as we discriminate on a wealth basis when it comes to taxes, if we did that with grammar schools and say, if X percent of the country is in the lowest bracket, then you X percent of your students have to be from that bracket as well. But then, then it wouldn't. Thing. But then it wouldn't be a grammar school, Spencer. A grammar school is a school at which you pass a test at the age of eleven, proving, in in, this, in, in inverted commas, proving that you are. Uh, of sufficient cleverness and intelligence and potential that you should be separated from your peers and given an extra special education whilst your peers get left behind. That's what a grammar school is. That, that was, would be if you got X marks, you'd get into the grammar school. Yeah. If you said, say, from the bottom bracket, you take the best X number of students from that bracket and the number of students who aren't in the best X percent from that bracket or sent to the other schools. So it would be still be a selective form of education. It would just be a bit different from what we had in the 1950s. But why should we do it? What, what good will come of it, Spencer? Well, I think you can get a higher... If you put the intelligent kids together, or the more intelligent kids together, you can get a higher standard of education for those kids. And if you had the bracket system, I think that would improve social mobility. But you can do that in the same school. You can have kids that are particularly gifted at mathematics being streamed in the state school system uh, so that their uh, brilliance in mathematics can, uh, can accelerate. You don't have to send them to a separate school with a fancier uniform, with a fancier name, and with the prestige and elite status that inevitably widens the gap in our society. No, because if you take it from the bottom bracket, it's not going to be a wider gap. I think you would have, yes, you can do sets in schools, but you can't set art. It's the attitude of the students around you. If you group the more intelligent kids together, they're going to have a more 
positive attitude in school. Well, I, I'm afraid the relationship between uh, uh, intelligence and good behaviour is not actually borne out in practice. And what you are suggesting is not a grammar school. And if it were, uh, then the grammar school idea would not now be being promoted by Maggie May. Spencer, if my auntie had a beard, she'd be my uncle. Thanks for calling Talk Radio and the mother of all talk shows. Now, coming up after the break, Lord Alan Watson talks about his new book, Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World. And also, of course, the best of Ian Lee coming up at 10pm. And Sunday morning from 8am, catch Jake Yap's unique look at the week's news. They try to understand TTIP in what the hell is going on. The setters return and their guest lecturer, is Professor Peter Ayton. All that and more from 8 a.m. Sunday on Talk Radio. Now, uh, I know Lord Alan Watson to be a master of history. I know him to be, uh, I think he won't blame me for saying, a partisan of Winston Churchill, who, like Lord Watson, was once upon a time a liberal. Though, of course, Churchill was a Tory, then a Liberal, and then a Tory again. He ratted on the Tories, but he re-ratted and went back. Uh, Professor uh, Alan, now Lord Alan Watson, has produced an interesting new book, a copy of which I have on my bedside table uh, right at this moment. Um, and it's true to say that I'm getting a very large amount of Twitter traffic that disagrees with me about Winston Churchill. Well, you're going to have to listen to my conversation with Lord Watson to properly understand it and him. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Now, we couldn't get Tom Watson over the last eight weeks or so, the big ugly bear, but we've got a better class of Watson. He's Lord Alan Watson, former president of the Liberal Democrats, four-time parliamentary candidate from theirs. He's a master historian uh, from Cambridge University, and he's also a Churchill buff. He knows everything about Winston Churchill, and he has identified two speeches after leaving office in 1945 that Churchill made at Fulton, Missouri, and in Zurich, which changed the course of history. Not necessarily for the better, as we will discover in the course of this debate that I'm about to have with them, but indisputably, they changed the course of history. His new book is called Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World, published by Bloomsbury, here and in the United States, and we're lucky to have him on the line from lovely Somerset. Lord Watson, thanks for joining us. <laughs> well, good to join you. Tell us, uh, first of all, about the book. Tell us about these two speeches and why they were so important. Well, um, they were important, of course, uh, geopolitically, if you like, but they were also very important for Winston Churchill as a man, because having lost office in 45, uh, he was captured by what was famously known as the black dog mood, and he was seriously uh, depressed about the condition he found himself in. Uh, he was, after all, uh, left the Potsdam Conference in order to return to the general election. He didn't fight a very good general election, and he lost it resoundingly, and uh, found himself you know, suddenly transformed from being one of the most powerful and important people in the world to being leader of uh, His Majesty's opposition in the House of Commons. And it wasn't a transition that um, gave him any pleasure, and indeed it depressed him significantly. And his restoration of his own morale... Really Just before you leave that, didn't he actually say that he, he should rather have died than be in the position that you describe? No, that's exactly what he said. And uh, he said, you know, like Franklin Roosevelt, I should have died. And uh, he, of course, did not. And he was, um, he also said to Lord Moran, who was his doctor, um, the flies are gathering on the corpse. 
uh, he was that depressed. And then he suddenly is presented with an opportunity which he hadn't foreseen. Uh, he's at Chartwell and uh, his assistant comes in and puts a letter in front of him. And the letter is from a college, Westminster College, Fulton, Missouri, which was not famous, in fact, relatively unknown. And it's a pretty standard letter and it's uh, offering him an honorary degree and saying, will you come and speak, you see? And um, he got quite a lot of these letters, of course. But then he looked down the bottom of the page, and there in handwriting uh, from Harry Truman, the new president of the United States, is this simple message which says, this is uh, a college, a very good college in my own home state. If you come and speak, I will introduce you. I will be there with you. And Winston Churchill immediately thinks, what does this mean? This means 18 hours on the train with the new president of the United States right back in the center of things. So, of course, he accepts with alacrity, and he makes this speech uh, in Fulton, Missouri, the first of these two uh, epoch-making speeches, really, in 1946. Tell us how they were, as it were, heard. I mean, the audience... Of course, nowadays, uh, I mean, we could live stream, never mind Churchill, you could live stream a speech yeah. by Tom Watson, uh, which would, uh, by live streaming, go around the world. None of that was available in 1946. No, there was, of course, radio, and there was the printed media, and Churchill knew a great deal about both those two media, and, uh, in fact, there was uh, a worldwide radio coverage of both speeches, the speech in Fulton, Missouri, and the speech in Zurich. And um, the atmosphere in Fulton was extraordinary when he actually arrived there with the president. And uh, they walked into this uh, town, and he gave his speech in the little university's gymnasium, uh, where, incidentally, I'm going to go <laughs> later on this year. And uh, they've even resuscitated the car that Winston Churchill and Harry Truman uh, went into the town. It may even raise the sap in your own veins. Well, Alan. it does a bit, you know, George. It does <laughs> a bit. But it certainly did for Churchill. And he called this speech originally the sinews of peace. But uh, it became retrospectively known as the Iron Curtain speech. And the purpose of it, in his mind, was pretty straightforward, really. Uh, he was very worried by the return of the Americans by tens of thousands every week leaving Europe and going back to the United States because the European war was over. And he saw this as denuding the defense of Western Europe, given the extraordinary um, presence of the Red Army in the middle of Europe, uh, 300 divisions. And um, he was very concerned that Stalin's ambition uh, would not actually stop simply in the eastern sector of Berlin, but would wish to embrace the whole of Berlin and then maybe go much further within Western Europe. So his primary purpose was to alert American public opinion, as he saw it, to the realities of Stalin and uh, the Soviet position. And so he says to them, you know, it's not good old Uncle Joe. It's actually Stalin who has absolute power within the Soviet Union and has extended that power over most of Eastern Central Europe and is poised to take more. So you've got to think again. And his his answer uh, is that um, there has to be an alliance uh, between the United States and the United Kingdom, but basically a Western alliance, and it has to use the breathing space that the temporary monopoly of an atomic bomb had given the United States to send a very clear signal to Stalin that thus far but no further. And He was effectively announcing uh, the beginning of the Cold war, wasn't he? I think you could say that, and uh, that's certainly how the Kremlin saw it, but it's also how American public opinion saw it. So this speech was immensely controversial, 
and the Roosevelt family in particular were appalled by it and there were a lot of people who said basically what is Churchill trying to do? He's trying to involve us in some sort of British imperial plan, uh, the end result of which will be to make Stalin an enemy and not an ally. Uh, he saw it completely differently. His, his attitude, you know, George, to Russia was actually very interesting because he had said um, in a toast in the Kremlin in 1942 uh, that it is you, the Russians, who have torn the guts out of the Nazi war machine. Uh, he had a huge admiration for Russian courage and Russian ability, but he also had a deep concern about where their ambitions and the ambitions of their leadership might take Europe, and he wanted to draw a line. And so for him, Fulton is about drawing a line. Wouldn't another way uh, of putting that, yeah. Lord Watson, be this, that uh, Churchill was a lifelong hater, of communism and during the brief but crucial period uh, in which as he put it uh, the uh, if uh, if Hitler invaded hell uh, <laughs> I would have a favorable thing or two to say about the devil in the House of Commons he recognized almost uniquely the mm. vital importance of an alliance with the Soviet Union, yeah. the, re the rely reliance on the Red Army to tear the guts out of the Nazi war machine. But once the war was over, he reverted back to his habitual, visceral anti-communism. Well, he was an anti-Bolshevik, right? And he always had been. And he believed that Bolshevism um, would do very little for the world and even less for Russia itself. That, that was his position. That's what he actually emotionally and intellectually believed. Yeah. He never made any secret of that and uh, uh, he and Stalin would sometimes um, really joust almost about that because Stalin was well aware of Churchill's anti-Bolshevism uh, and uh, Churchill was under no illusions about the nature of Stalin's rule. So yeah, there, there is a sort of there's a strange kind of mutual respect between these two, sure. uh, which lasts the whole of the course of the Second World War. But what, um, what I think changed Churchill's mind, there were a number of specific things at the, at the end, but he was very concerned that Roosevelt uh, was, in his view, I think, being duped by Stalin. And that the promises that Stalin had made about free democratic choice of the form of government and so on in the countries which were liberated from the Nazis, but then in effect occupied by the Red Army, that these were not really worth the paper they were written on. And in particular, uh, that surfaces of the Potsdam Conference, of course, which is the last one of the two. Uh, incidentally, there is a rather an amusing anecdote about that last Potsdam conference because Churchill is suddenly ripped from the top table in the world, you know, he's sitting there with President Truman, who's replaced Franklin Roosevelt, of course, with Stalin, and there's Churchill. And after just a very short number of days, he has to go back to London to face the general election. And Stalin, uh, in <laughs> almost fatherly sort of way, says to Churchill, he doesn't say don't worry, but he says, you know, I have never lost an election. <laughs> <laughs> that had the benefit of being true. Lord Watson, I have to take a short break for some yes. capitalist messages. If you'll bear with me, I'd like to go on talking to you after the break. Yes, fine, absolutely. And we've got Zurich to talk about. We well. do. A, a speech on which uh, I view with a rather greater favour. <laughs> I guess so. Big Georgie Galloway's back on the radio! Galloway, celebrate! The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. Now, this night in 1940, as indeed the last few nights and more than 50 nights still to come, Londoners in particular were being blitzed, bombarded remorselessly. Thousands of our people were killed, many thousands were wounded, uh, perhaps as many as 200,000. But they never surrendered. 
and one of the reasons why they never surrendered was because by then they had a leader who was ready to stand firm until he choked in his own blood rather than surrender to the beast of Hitler fascism. All of his crimes and sins prior to that moment were expiated in my view by that stand that he made and its concurrent conclusion that an alliance with Stalin and with the Soviet Union would be necessary, desirable, indispensable in defeating that fascist beast. This expiates, this washes the sins and crimes of his past in my view. I'm well aware that not all of you agree with me. And my guest this evening, Lord Watson, uh, doesn't even agree that all of those were crimes and sins, though I hope we'll be able to come on to some of them. But we're talking about Lord Watson's new book, Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World, both delivered in 1946, the first of which we've already spoken in Fulton, Missouri, which could be said to have laid the tracks for the Cold War, for NATO, uh, for the Iron Curtain, which he, a phrase which he, of course, uh, um, uh, coined and which is now uh, commonplace in our language, one of many actually, that Churchill coined, which have become commonplace. But let's move on, Lord Watson, to the second of those speeches. Tell us about the Zurich speech. George, uh, can I just make one comment though, about what you've just said about 1940, yes. which I think is very important in understanding all of this. Britain was alone in 1940. Yes. Uh, the USSR joins the war when Hitler attacks Russia. The United States joins the war when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. There was this absolutely critical period, uh, France having been defeated, continental Europe having been occupied, when actually it was Churchill and Great Britain who stood alone and changed the course of history. Yeah. Now, um, when I was writing this book, Two Speeches to Change the World, uh, I was confronted, of course, by an assumption that uh, the great moment in Churchill's life is 1940 and his greatest contribution, apart from his own courage, determination and skill, was his oratorical ability to communicate through the speeches that he made, all now world famous, of course, iconic speeches. And really, did anything much happen with Churchill after that? In my view, and indeed in Churchill's view, uh, the speeches he made in 1946 were of were as important in their way as were the speeches he made in 1940. That first one, which we've discussed just now, uh, Fulton, Missouri, uh, he saw as critical in engaging the commitment of the United States to the defense of Western Europe. The second speech he made in Zurich was different, and let me just try and explain that difference. When Winston Churchill went to the United States in 1946, he had two missions. One was to make that speech, the Fulton, Missouri speech. The other was to try and persuade the Americans to reverse their decision to end Lend-Lease at the end of the Second World War and to extend lines of credit to Britain, which was bust. And more broadly, to begin to actually commit American resources to the economic re restoration, rebuilding of Western Europe, including Western Germany. Now, that, uh, in retrospect, may all seem pretty obvious stuff, but actually... It was very Churchill, controversial at the time. Hugely, and Churchill got nowhere with it. Uh, absolutely nowhere. I mean, on the Hill, he had all these contacts, people he knew, very influential people, and they basically said, look, Winston, uh, come on, uh, Britain is bust, Germany's been destroyed, France is on the edge of political chaos and maybe uh, communist government, Italy is totally chaotic, and Spain is a fascist autocracy. You know, it's not worth a goddamn dollar. And something in Churchill tells him, maybe his half-American ancestry, that if he's going to change the American attitude towards restoring Europe, not just defending it, restoring it, actually 
actually the Europeans have got to get their own act together. They have to do something remarkable, astonishing, surprising. And that's what the Zurich speech is about. He gets up 1946, six months after Fulton, Missouri, uh, a time when the, um, the Nuremberg trials on the Nazi atrocities at Daily News, uh, when the French are executing traitors and collaborators and so on. And he says, I am going to startle you. And my goodness, he does, because what he proposes is a kind of United States of Europe led, led by a partnership between France and Germany. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. And General de Gaulle went virtually apoplectic, you know, when he heard and read the speech. It was an extraordinary thing. So these two speeches, if you take them together, startled, astonished, outraged, enraged people uh, in throughout the whole of the Western world and indeed the Soviet Union. But actually, they triggered a process which in one case eventually leads to NATO, and in the other case, triggers a process which eventually, through the Marshall Plan, uh, leads to the cooperation between France and Germany, the coal and steel community, which eventually becomes the European Union. Now, I listened to the Zurich speech. Yes. It was uh, a feast of intellect and oratory and... Even the it's political a good word. line. A good word in the Chichilian context. <laughs> yes, it was. It was also politically correct. I was a campaigner, as you know, yes. uh, to leave the European Union, but I'd vote for a United States of Europe because yeah. that would be a democratically elected and removable. Uh, government, we'd have a, an elected president, a Congress, a Senate, we'd have checks and balances, and above all, the uh, European Central Bank would be under political control, democratic control. Mm. Um, it was a, a fantastic speech. I, I urge every, it's available on YouTube. I urge everyone to listen to it. Yes. Um, you can't imagine any British politician perhaps except thee and me, making <laughs> such a, a speech today. They they simply don't have the, the wherewithal. Am I right, Lord Watson? I think it's about vision. And uh, Churchill actually gave an interview to the Daily Telegraph, as it happens, a couple of weeks before he made the Zurich speech. And it has a very powerful image in it. He says, think of a Spanish prisoner languishing in a dungeon hundreds of years ago. And the man, poor man, has been there for decades. And he feels himself entirely imprisoned. But then one day he staggers to his feet and he pushes the prison door and it opens. And he's free. And in a way, Churchill was saying, look, we are in a prison of our own making. We have the terrible consequences of the Second World War, all the destruction and division and everything else. And unless we actually go to this prison door and push it, we will not be able to go out into a new world. I think we're in a very similar position today, that because people are all totally concerned with dangers, risks, problems, all of that, it in a way prevents them from thinking of something new, something fresh. And that's, Churchill was, he was, he was a realist, you know, but he had this extraordinary resilience. And um, he was never going to take defeat as an answer to a challenge. And um, I think it's very important in our own imagination and our own thinking now, uh, after Brexit and everything else, we need, and, and God knows what will happen in the United States, we've got to, in a way, take a leap of imagination and say, not only what do we wish to prevent, but what do we actually wish to create? Yeah. Now, l lastly, just uh, digressing a little bit, the Parliament is going to be closed down and dispersed uh, for to get rid of the rats, the four-legged <laughs> variety. Uh, and there's a proposal to cap the number of members of the House of Lords. What do you think of that? 
Well, I'm in favor of an elected second chamber. And I do think that we have far too many members of the House of Lords at the moment, partly because um, the Conservative Party, when it won its own mandate in the last general election, suddenly realized rather late in the day that this was uh, the end of their majority in the House of Lords. So, of course, they've created a whole raft of new peers, and we just have too many. Uh, I think there's no doubt about that. But um, I would like I would like not for us to tinker with it. I think we need to do something radical. And we are moving towards a new way of governing ourselves in the United Kingdom. I mean, we have uh, much greater autonomy for Scotland and who knows what will happen elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Maybe what we ought to consider is using the second chamber and elected chamber to really represent and express um, the new nature of the United Kingdom, where we will have different nations and regions with much more power, the great cities of London and Manchester and all the rest of it playing a quite different role. Maybe something could be done uh, in an elected chamber. But on the immediate question, do we have too many peers? Yes. Well, maybe I'll sit with you one day in that elected second chamber. Lord Watson, you're a star man. Lord Alan Watson, author of a new book published by Bloomsbury, Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World. I think that was an excellent interview. I hope that you do too. In the next hour, I'll be talking about Korea. It's all coming up. Across the UK, online and on DAB. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. On Talk Radio, we'll get you talking. Listen up, comrades of the world. Unite! He's a weapon of mass discussion and he's back on your radio. Get ready for a revolutionary rumble on your radio with the original George of the political jungle. Galloway, celebrate. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Come have a go if you think you're hard enough. Get it? On the radio station that gives power to the people. Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. 0844 499 1000. That's the number to call. Or tweet me. Why don't you? At George Galloway or at Talk Radio or at both. In the next hour, we'll be talking about nutters and cold-blooded killers getting their hands on nuclear weapons. But enough about Trump and Clinton and Netanyahu. We'll be talking to an expert about Korea and the young un who seems now to be able to pack a rather formidable punch. It's the mother of all talk shows. Call me, have a go, if you think you're hard enough. Get it? The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. You get it? You get my point? I'm as appalled as anybody else that the young un, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, now appears to have a far more formidable uh, nuclear punch than he had yesterday or than we knew he had yesterday. But then I was carried off by Strathclyde Police's finest and thrown into a cell in Greenock Jail for protesting against nuclear weapons. So I have a right to be appalled. It surprises me a little that people are who are quite content at George W. Bush having his finger on a nuclear button, or Donald Trump if he's elected in November, or Hillary Clinton if she is, or for that matter, for David Cameron or Theresa May or Tony Blair to have his finger on very substantial numbers of very, very powerful thermonuclear weapons. It seems to me a little, well, hypocritical. Uh, for them to claim to be so appalled as I have a right to be. Korea is a fascinating, often disturbing place. You'd have to know the history, and I don't have time to tell it you. But the fact is, North Korea lost 20% of its entire population in the Korean War, launched by the United States and Britain and other countries uh, more than half a century ago. 
North Korea is surrounded by hostile states, constantly on war maneuvers against it. It is deeply paranoid. It would be a good idea, if you ask me, for everyone to take a step back from the consequences of that paranoia. But hey, I'm not the honorary senior research fellow in sociology and modern Korea. Aidan Foster Carter is, and he's been good enough to join us at this late hour on the mother of all talk shows. Aidan, thanks for joining us. It's it's a pleasure. Uh, you left out Leeds University, and uh, I was a former resident of Bradford, so I'm sure you'd like... I should mention both of those me. points. Yes, Leeds University. You on one thing, just yeah. to start with, I think we may agree more than some might expect, but the question of who started the Korean War is not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of fact, and it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't us lot, honest gov. Um, that that's just now established. We have the Russian and the Chinese well, archives. Well, it was it was us that joined it, Professor. Surely. Yeah, we on behalf of the United Nations. Well, you say that, but yeah. the the Soviet Union yeah, wasn't in the okay. United Nations, and neither was China at the time. There was a paradox, indeed, that the Soviet Union was boycotting the UN at the time, or they could have exercised a veto and stopped it being that. But in terms of who crossed the border, it's perfectly clear. Yes, it's an old nation unified for many hundreds of years. Indeed. Tragic then and now that it was divided as a temporary measure. It was occupied by Japan, and then the people who liberated it divided it. There's an awful lot of tragedy in that. But in terms of who actually crossed the border for the gamble, I mean, the South was itching to do it. It was the North who actually did it. But anyway, we probably want to talk about the present day stuff. We do. Tell us what happened today. What happened today is that North Korea launched its first, uh, sorry, its fifth nuclear test. Um, these have all happened in the past decade. It's the only country, uh, new country, that, no, the only country at all that's tested nuclear weapons in this century. You quite rightly point out it's far from being the world's only, uh, only nuclear power. The pace has definitely accelerated under Kim Jong-un grandson, you know, of the founder of the regime. It's a strange thing how communism turns into, into a kind of monarchy, but again, maybe we won't go there, maybe we will. He's accelerating the pace. Um, we don't know. It, it was the biggest one yet. Apparently, you can tell that. From, I'm not a, a nuclear expert, but you can tell it from the seismographic records. Whether he can really fit a warhead on a missile, as he claims, um, we, don't, we don't know for sure. But um, it, it's certainly... a a, co a cause for worry, no doubt about that at all. Indeed, uh, although uh, this is, the, I promised the last paradox I'll bowl at you. Uh, I, I heard them talking in shocked terms at the possibility that North Korea might have a missile which could reach the United States, but the United States has thousands of missiles that could reach North Korea and indeed well, are, are, and indeed that, are pointed right. at it. In, yeah, if it, it's, uh, you're welcome to bold paradoxes because there are many and it's good to, to, to query the conventional wisdom. There is, I mean, one thing we'd certainly agree on is there's a, a lot of hypocrisy in the international nuclear order. There are other undeclared nuclear powers. I saw in the Jerusalem Post that Israel condemns North Korea and it's not so long ago that the Israelis tried to buy off the North Korean missile program, which, which would actually be, be, be another story. Um, Sorry, go on. Yeah, uh, the, the, the thousand mile uh, reach of this Rodong missile, which landed in the Sea of Japan recently, seems to indicate a, a, a parallel increase in their ballistic missile capability and oh, the nuclear right. firepower. Yeah, there was uh, the Japanese who were very much in the front line, like the South Koreans, have been totting up the statistics. And uh, Kim Jong-il, the middle one, the father of the present one, so he, he launched about one ballistic missile. These are things they're told not to do by the UN about once a year. And so 17 in total in his reign, whereas the sun is heading for 40. And most of them have been since the latest UN resolution in, in, in March this year. The, the thing I was going to say is um, the... The North Korean rationale for having these things seems to me to resemble the views of the National Rifle Association in the United States, why every good citizen should have a gun, because there mm. are bad people out there. And for those of us who think that's that's crazy, um, which I suppose excludes a lot of... <laughs> I'm afraid uh, it does, <laughs> um, as yeah, you might I'm find afraid. out uh, in the congressional, yes. Senate and I'm, presidential elections, it definitely does. Most 
you know, there are, what, 200 nation states in the world of consequence. I'm glad that most of them, I mean, obviously everyone seeks security. I'm glad that most small countries think that it's a better idea either to, you know, to join international organizations, to form alliances and so on. Mm. If everybody went down toting like the North Koreans, I honestly cannot see that the world would be a safer place. And, uh, no, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree entirely. And I, I've been there. I, I don't know if you have, but... Uh, I have indeed, yes. Yeah. Mm. So we both know uh, it's a most peculiar... Uh, regime. Uh, yes. Frankly, uh, your description of it is as communist. I would, if we had more time, uh, contend vigorously. But let's look at what happens next, Professor. Mm. Um, is is it? I mean, I heard uh, Boris Johnson blustering uh, a minute ago, talking uh, about yeah. a robust uh, response. What do they mean by that? Uh, absolutely. Um, well, I'm not allowed to say to the radio hyphen all, I think. I mean, it, this, ha this, has, this has no meaning. I'm, in my view, and this is opinion, but I guess that's what we're here for as well, um, the, the fact that, not, that Kim Jong-un has just done this, second time in a year, very much accelerating the pace of his nuclear tests, shows that the, the, the distinct sort of hawkish turn that we've had in Western policy since January, since the last one, in fact, isn't working. I mean, goodness knows, North Korea is difficult. No one's really got the answer there. People will say, more hawkishness, yes, you know, or, or conversely, be nicer to them. I mean, I don't think that either of those necessarily work. What you need is some sort of calibrated mix of the stick and the carrot. And we dropped the carrot. Um, understandably, because you know, it's a nasty regime, it's very hard to form any kind of political coalition for, for aiding them and so on. But um, since January, it's all been about sanctions. It's all been about painting them into a corner. Much stronger sanctions than ever before, but don't seem to be working. I mean, China signed up to them on paper, but China holds all the cards on this one. Um, and uh, how far China is enforcing the sanctions, we don't know. China is cross, but there are things that China would detest more than the nuclear North Korea they have, and that would be a collapse of North Korea right on their borders, remember? They would hate the process of that, you know, would lose nukes, and they would hate the result, which would be a U.S. ally with U.S. Uh, troops and bases on its soil right on their borders. So um, they, they, they hold the cards, really, and uh, there is, there's so much bluster. You know, look, North Korea is very low-hanging fruit. We can all agree that North Korea is horrible and denounce it and denounce it, but then what do we do? It's, it, it's not working. We need to think of something else. Well, uh, I mean, George Orr is better than War War. We've been talking about Winston Indeed. Churchill uh, earlier, and there just hasn't been very much George Orr for quite a long time. And as we're not going to go to war with North Korea, as I always put it, uh, mm. uh, Iraq was invaded because it didn't have weapons of mass destruction. North Korea will not be invaded because it does have weapons of mass destruction. That only leaves George Orr, doesn't it? I well, that that is how I that's how I read things. I mean, admittedly, it, it, not to underestimate the difficulties that there is. There's a twenty-year history of talks with North Korea, and at various times along the way, we've been we've had other crises, and we've been in better places than we are now. I mean, anyone around who remembers 1994? I mean, that's when uh, Bill Clinton seriously thought of of striking the nuclear. Um, base that they have, sorry, the nuclear, um, yeah, nuclear base at Yongbyon, north of Pyongyang, because they were taking cooling rods out and, and so on, not to go into all the detail. But later that same year, Jimmy Carter intervened, saved the day. Um, we nearly had an inter-Korean summit, but Kim Il-sung died, but we did have an agreement with the United States. And the North Korean nuclear program, the known one, I think they, it was pretty clear they were cheating with another one, was in the can and under the inspection of IAEA. It was hard to say that on the radio, International Atomic Energy Agency. So, you know, we've, we've gone, I think, I think there has to be a, a diplomatic component. It is very difficult. I mean, also, they, they called the South Korean president all kinds of sexist names. They called Obama a wicked black monkey. I mean, it's hard to believe, you know, what kind of mindset um, thinks you can you can say that it would be clever or sensible to say anything like that or to think anything like that. Well, I don't know. The president of the Philippines was rewarded with a meeting with that same President Obama uh, after what he said. And the South Koreans got one instead. Yes, it's again rather like my NRA comparison earlier. I don't really want to encourage I mean, the, 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 the use of insult in public life too much. No, I agree. I'll tell you what, Professor. Uh, I'm beginning to think they should send thee and me there. We might be able to sort this out. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, uh, Professor, on that, but thank you. <laughs> Professor Aidan Foster Carter 
who's the Honorary Senior Research Fellow in Sociology and Modern Korea at the University of Leeds. And a very smart man, if you ask me. Louise Hart uh, sends on Twitter, loving the show, you said it in one perfect sentence, let's make all schools grammar schools. Uh, Simon Brian Ander says, gifted students leapfrog others. A lad at my school passed his GCSEs at 14. Class sets cater. Uh, Simon James says, social mobility is a tacit endorsement of the class system. In an equal society, no mobility would be needed. I wish I'd said that. I will. I will. I promise. 0844 499 1000. That's the number to call. You can uh, tweet me. You can text me. You can email me even. And uh, we've still got 45 minutes to go. So lots of time for you to have your say. 0844 499 1000. Tommy, have a go if you think you're hard enough. Get it? The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Let's get talking. First to Andrew in Helens Bay in the north of Ireland. Andrew, welcome. Hi, George. It's good to be back. Been busy for the past couple of weeks, so okay. I didn't want to make it a hat. Nice. Week very, very nice night. to hear from you again. What would you like to say? Um, yes, I'll come on to Korea very briefly before I get to the other points. Now, I'm no expert on Korea, but surely if uh, America and other nations around it disarm their nuclear weapons, well, I guess you never really know what North Korea will do. They may see, hopefully, that they are no longer under any nuclear threat, so they may disarm them. I'm not saying they will, so hopefully that may be a start. We all know from Hiroshima and Nagasaki with small atom- atomic bombs, the long-lasting effects and damage nuclear weapons have and would cause. So, of course, we're not going to attack them. Funnily enough, uh, Churchill, in that Zurich speech, talked about the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which at that stage, when he made it, only the United States had, and how they uh, potentially uh, would destroy the entire Earth, that the Earth and the human race would cease to exist. So it's kind of high stakes. Uh, I'm just pointing out the hypocrisy of people uh, who themselves are nuts, who themselves have a long history of attacking other countries and who themselves possess thousands of nuclear weapons, uh, going all uh, giddy and faint at the idea of North Korea having one. I know, like, I mean, I, I just don't understand it. But, uh, like, I mean, we're, we're, I'm all, we're all of us can agree on the fact that we all want nuclear disarmament, but surely... Why should why should some nations be allowed to have some and not others? You know yeah, that that it's argument a, doesn't it's make a deep, sense. Deeply racist uh, idea. Like I heard there was um, at the time. Uh, it's obviously things are a lot better now. There's far fewer nuclear weapons than there there was in the past. Like yeah, it, there the used Cold to be. Uh, the United States used to have twenty seven thousand nuclear weapons. Yeah, I heard I heard someone say I think it was my RE teacher once said um, they had enough nuclear weapons to blow up the world four hundred times at the peak of the Cold War or something like yes, that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, you. You wanted to talk about uh, the Labour leadership too, yeah? Yeah, yes. Um, Jeremy, oh, he was phenomenal last night. He was really no different per- class, wasn't no, he? No personal abuse, interacted with the audience so well. And the fact that Owen Smith's supporters who were there were applauding him tells you all you need to know about how superb his performance was. I, 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 I felt that it was meaningfully the end of the contest. Uh, nobody in their right mind would vote for for uh, for the uh, pharma chameleon uh, rather than Jeremy Corbyn. They might not like Jeremy Corbyn, but they mm-hmm. can't pretend uh, to themselves even that mm-hmm. uh, Owen Smith is a better and more electable leader. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, as for Owen, it, c- it couldn't have been any more contrasting. And there's an issue that he keeps making up, and, and I notice this every time he speaks, it's regarding the polls. I'm very sceptical regarding the polls considering how inaccurate they've been recently. The polls, the are, the polls, the, are, not, the polls are not a measure, Andrew, of public opinion. They're a means of creating public opinion. Thanks for the call. Good luck to you. Uh, Ray, my old friend in Ponte, Ponte Preeth in the South Wales Valley. Ray, welcome. Good evening, George. Good evening. What would you like to say? Um, I'd like to say um, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump... Electric chair or hanging. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah. would you prefer? <laughs> exactly. Um, 
who next will he be putting up? Do, uh, Donald Duck. <laughs> Donald, um, Donald Duck versus Mickey Mouse. At yeah. least, at least they probably wouldn't destroy the Earth. That's the, right. The, these two have every potential to. Um, George, if I bought your DVD, as I said to you before, uh -huh. and it's excellent. But thank you. If anybody with an ape of a sense could have uh, said that if they had chemical and biological weapons, we wouldn't have gone anywhere near them. Exactly, yeah. Could That's we, the George? point I just made about Korea. That, yeah. that there's no way of making a war against North Korea. Uh, yeah. So th that only leaves uh, George Jaw. That's right. George, somebody mentioned the Michael Moore DVD. I bought it the same time as I bought yours. Yeah. And he does... Uh, uh, an in-depth, he goes round the countries in Europe, their educational systems. And the Danish system is top. Now, why can't we go send a delegation over here? I mean, our education is devolved in Wales, but it's bottom of the pile. They even diverted money from health into education. It's still dire now. And, and bring that model back here. When Michael Moore contends... Us and America, what they want to do is keep the population dumb, and then when they get to, um, say, 16 or 17, then play the fear card. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I do. I do, absolutely. Ray, thanks. But, but uh, look, I've got... Uh, DVD, it's really good. I will do. I've got to press on because of the hour and the number of people trying to get through. Let's go to Grant in Aloha. Go ahead, Grant. Hi there, George. Hi. Um, what I was looking to talk about, George, and um, you were actually around about... Um, when it happened, um, when Tony Blair came in to, obviously, as leader, he tried to change the brand of Labour, and I believe, personally, it resulted in taking away the working class voice. And what I mean by that is, um, all, he kind of tried to create a middle class image about Labour, and eventually we, we end up having no working class MPs giving a voice for the working class to this day and age, and it's not that I resent the work. I, it's not that I resent the middle class. It's just that I, I definitely, I definitely think that there needs to be a more balance within the Labour Party, as in I want to see more working class MPs out there talking, talking for us. If, if you get what I'm saying, George. I do. And look, when I entered Parliament in 1987, there were I was a sponsored uh, MP from the then Transport and General Workers Union, uh, there were well over 100, maybe nearer to 150 trade union-sponsored MPs, uh, people who had been uh, dockers and miners and engineering workers and uh, all kinds of trades who'd lived in the real world, who'd represented workers at various levels. Uh, and all of that uh, is... A thing of the past. By the time I left Parliament in 2015, I was one of a tiny handful of Labour members of Parliament who had not, A, been to university, uh, B, uh, been a, a kind of uh, a researcher or SPAD uh, or the kind of fast-track transmission belt of a political class from student politics straight onto the uh, floor of the House of Commons, straight onto the front bench and into ministerial office. It is a lamentable development and we have all been cheated by it. Grant, thanks uh, for that. Let me take a few uh, tweets and so on. Well, Adrian says, uh, Theresa May has no mandate. Everybody seems oblivious to the fact that she was appointed not elected as Prime Minister. Absolutely. Uh, now, I said earlier uh, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn had performed like Jim Baxter in his pomp, uh, but uh, the time traveller says more a mixture of all the best qualities of Jinky, that's Jimmy Johnson of the Celtic, and uh, Jim Baxter and Davy Cooper, two of the greatest of all Rangers uh, players. Fair enough, fair enough. It was the strolling point that I had in mind. Uh, that's why I chose Baxter. He, Jim Baxter with the ball at his feet, you got the impression, like a knife through butter, he could stroll through the opposition because he was head and shoulders uh, above them. That's the point I was making. Peter Cook says, the tax system isn't directly related to a quality, fully fund public education system. And Cheryl 
Lera says when a terrorist is armed by the U.S., he's called a freedom fighter. When the U.S. invades a country, it's called liberation. And Mark Doran says any guesses as to who said, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. Wrong hero, GG. Well, Mark, you just weren't listening, or maybe you sent that tweet before I explained. Nobody needs to educate me on the racist and imperialist and conservative Tory right-wing character of Winston Churchill. Nobody needs to tell me about his crimes against the people of Ireland, against the people of Tony Pandey in the south of Wales, against the people in George Square in uh, in Glasgow, uh, against whom he sent uh, tanks, about his role in the general strike. Nobody needs to lecture me on these things. Mark, my point is that there would be no Britain. There would be no democracy. There would be no freedom. There would be no mother of all talk shows. There would be no ability to communicate progressive or left-wing ideas at all because the Gestapo would be ruling our country. The Wehrmacht would have invaded and occupied us and might occupy us still and not just us but be in occupation, fascism, triumphing across the entire globe. Don't you get my point? It can't get much more serious than that. There would be nothing, do you understand? Just a void, if not for the decision of Churchill to refuse to surrender when his foreign secretary, Halifax, and the, the king himself was ready to make a surrender peace with Hitler. And others, including the owners of the major newspapers, wanted to actually see the victory of Hitlerism. Don't you see, Mark, that no matter how many vile quotes from Winston Churchill you throw at me, that moment in time, that moment on which the entire history of the world turned is what expiates, what wipes any crime, any sin, any ugly statement ever made by Winston Churchill. He's a weapon of mass discussion and he's back on your radio. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. 0844 499 1000. Call me up. You've still got 25 minutes or so to get through and join the great debate. Now, uh, the best of Ian Lee is coming up after me at 10 o'clock. And tomorrow morning from 8 a.m., Benny Smith catches you up on the news stories you might have missed this week. Amy Schindler is in to talk about her new play, Burning Bridges, and Penny talks to author Louise Candlish. All that is from 8 a.m. and only on talk radio. Uh, Karminski says, uh, well, we've got plenty of health and safety, equality and diversity in managers, though, so all is well. Not. Uh, George, I know you don't like Hillary, but please, it's time to support the lesser of two evils before it's too late. Even Bernie had to, says Ray in London. But I don't accept that she's the lesser of two evils. Neither do I accept this concept of always going for the lesser of two evils, because that's an open invitation for everybody at the top to get more and more evil. Because if the lesser evil knows that they can count on your support, no matter how evil they themselves are, then there is no stopping them becoming more and more evil. So Bernie shouldn't have. Bernie should have run as an independent presidential candidate with my candidate, Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party, as his running mate. That's what should have happened. And if I had a vote, it would now be going to Dr. Jill. Let's hear from Edward in Barnet on Trump and Clinton. Go ahead, Edward. Yeah, hi, George. Hi, hi there. Hi. Um, well, ordinarily, I think I disagree with you on most things. On this issue of Trump and Clinton, I tend to agree with a lot of the things that you say. I think that one of the issues I have, though, is, you see, certainly in the British media, Trump gets a really rough ride, which I think is totally deserved. A lot of the things he says are 
vile and it's, he should be exposed for exactly what he is. But Clinton seems to get a very, very easy ride. She and does, a lot of the she does, yeah. A lot of the scandals she's been involved in, and you know the scandals, whether it's the more sort of harmless things, you know, lying about coming under sniper fire in Bosnia, whitewater scandal. I mean, there's a whole raft of things. They just don't get talked about, and these things get brushed under the carpet. And I'm just really curious for your thoughts on why we've continuously got this barrage of rhetoric coming out of Trump, which is making front pages. But then with Clinton, there's so much more I think we could be talking about, which just never gets exposure in the media, and that's on the left and on the right. Yeah, absolutely. They want Clinton to win. So they are covering up the gigantic scandals. Uh, I mean, the one you quoted uh, is a scandal only in that it proves her to be a liar. Uh, well, of course, most uh, leading politicians are liars. Uh, but it is an important example of which she is ready to invent uh, uh, facts which... Uh, are simply contradicted even by the simplest uh, look at the video and uh, and public record. But the other scandals that she is involved in are far, far more grave. And I have no doubt at all that we're in for more and more war if Hillary Clinton becomes the president. And I will not support her. Uh, I don't accept... Uh, by the way, that she's less evil than uh, Donald Trump. You could make an argument, I don't, that actually he's less evil than her, in the sense that he's less ready to go to war with all and sundry. I don't myself. I think they're equally uh, evil well, and money equally well. dangerous. I mean go on, go on, Edward. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that she'll take money from anyone. And if you look at going back to Bill Clinton's reign and the money that they were taking, the well, the lack of transparency in the yeah, money deeply, they were taking. They're deeply corrupt people, the Clintons. But it just doesn't get exposed. I don't understand it. And it's a, it's a left and a right issue. They don't want to come out with it. And I understand in the American media, because obviously America, they want their president, they want Clinton, they see Trump as a huge uncertainty and a massive liability. But why in the British media does it not get the same exposure? Well, uh, as I said, they, they want to. First of all, you've got the feminist uh, angle uh, at play uh, that uh, the liberal media, the Guardian and so on, are infatuated with the idea of a woman president, even if the woman is a monster. I mean, we had a woman prime minister, but she was a monster. So she was no gain uh, for the female gender, in my view. And uh, neither would uh, having Hillary Clinton... And Bill, because, of course, he'll be moving in with her, having them uh, running the White House again. Uh, I, I just don't accept that that is a good thing. No, I don't. I don't think it is a good thing. I don't even think they have a particularly good track record. And I think that there's something really to be said about the fact that if she does become president, we're going to have had four of the last five presidents. I think it is. We're coming from two families and we're not talking about two exceptional families. And it really raises the question in a country of so many resources, a huge population, so much, you know, fantastic universities, so much talent. How can they come up with these two awful people? Well, in a way, that, you know, Edward, that is the $64,000 question, uh, as they used to call it. And I've asked it of John Le Boutillier and other uh, American sages over the years. Uh, and, and, and I just, I honestly don't get it. The, the United States, with its fantastic universities, its fantastic fantastic science base, its fantastic level of, uh, of achievement, its can-do spirit that can send people to the moon and headed towards Mars and so on, they come up with these two as the best uh, choice available. It doesn't make any sense to me, that. Well, I think it's largely finance, isn't it? You look at who can get who can get themselves bankrolled, who can get themselves yeah, in front but, but of, why, why of exposure, who's got that kind of money. I don't think, in this country, at least you can say, if you don't have a lot of money, you can get yourself into Parliament. Here, it's a, uh, sorry, in America, it's a completely different story. Yeah, but, I mean, why, why can't better people than those two uh, fundraise and, and get people behind them? Why not? Because the richer tend to have the bigger connections. So if you've got more money, you're likely to have better connections and you're better likely to get that sort of funding. And I think in the case of Clinton in particular, she'll take funding from anyone. So they'll happily sort of broaden their coffers uh, with money which comes from perhaps sources which, if it was in this country, would be totally unacceptable. 
Yeah, I'm with you on that. Edward, it's been a pleasure talking to you, even if you normally disagree with me. Thanks very much for calling the show. You've still got a few minutes to do so. Uh, if you haven't, 0844 499 Pardon me, 1,000, but let me go through more of the tweets, etc. Uh, Levi Jordan says, Jeremy was nothing short of sensational in Luke the Part 2. Have you been giving him fashion tips, George? My lips are sealed, but I thought he looked very smart. Ian Gold says, I guess she put DNC phone hacking allegations as a top security issue, which shows how insane she is. Michael John says, how can we distinguish between a real terrorist attack and a false flag attack designed to sway public opinion? Well, uh, Michael, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, the chances are it will be a duck. Adam Eccles says, I think the United States will lose no matter which candidate is chosen. In my opinion, they are both awful. I agree. What do you say? 0844 499 1000. Particularly if you're a woman. If you're a woman, pick up the phone now and dial me. 0844 499 1000. Because I'm determined that this will not be the talk sport type of show to male dominated. Although we have had, I think, two women callers uh, tonight. That's better than normal, but it's still not 50-50, which is the least I expect. Listener comrades of the world, unite the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Now, the aforementioned Mark Doran is getting silly now on uh, Twitter uh, with reference to the points I made about Churchill earlier, he says, gosh, Churchill did all that. How did one man shoot down all those bombers and fighters, sink those U-boats, etc.? Listen, Mark, my point is, if not for Churchill, we wouldn't have been shooting them down. We wouldn't have been fighting them. If not for Churchill, we would have surrendered to them, and there would have been nobody shooting them, nobody sinking them. You're a young man, so I'm going to give you the... Uh, the exculpation that comes with actually not knowing what you are talking about. But listen to somebody who does know. And here's what I know. That the ruling elite in Britain wanted to surrender to Hitler. Either because they secretly or even openly agreed with him, or because they thought the cause was lost. And if it were not for the fact that Churchill came to power in 1940, the war would have been over. Don't you understand that, Mark? And if it had been over, fascism, Nazism would have triumphed. And therefore, everything else would be a void, would be a nothing. Think of that, a nothing. Maria's on in Peckham. Go ahead, Maria. Oh, hello, George. I'm glad um, I made a call for a woman caller, and I've got one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, the reason why I'm call calling you tonight is uh, because I like for you um, maybe to raise awareness about what's happening to people who are ill and applying for benefits and how this uh, health assessment advisory service is, is using private companies that treat people really appallingly. I am a victim of that system and there are a few private companies. So tell me, what, what happened to you? Well, what happened to me was... Um, Suffering from depression, I had really bad flu spells every winter. I was fit, and then I was diagnosed with post-viral um, fatigue syndrome, etc. Um, I went to one of these um, assessments, and. I was given zero points. Apparently, it's a point that if you can lift your left arm, well, can you lift your right arm? Some, there was a lady there. I thought it was a doctor. I think I learned that they're not doctors. Um, a few months after, I was fighting for my life. 
So that's they that's found you. Fun. They found you to be fit for work when you were Absolutely. not fit to work. This is part of this scandal, <laughs> the Atos uh, scandal, uh, which we will talk about on another night. But it's really good that you made the point because it is a part of Tory Britain that is underexposed. The only disaster is that it was introduced not by the Tories, but by the last Labour government. Maria, thanks for the call. I'm pressing on only because of the hour. And I want to hear Lizzie in Gloucester on grammar schools. Go ahead, Lizzie. Hello. How are you? I'm good, by the grace of God. The better for hearing from you. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, I did tweet to you earlier that uh, I went to grammar school and my brothers and sisters were all slightly aghast and, and still treat me with some contempt now uh, because they failed the 11 plus. Yeah, because they were deemed failures and you were deemed a success at, el felt, at, el at 11 felt, years of age. That's right, but I felt that I was going, that I was going to somewhere I was academically more advanced than others so I felt that I was going to somewhere that would feed that academia and they were going to somewhere that would feed their abilities and skills in other directions, uh, such as engineering, building, farming. That's the, of course, that was true for some, but yes. not, not for the real engineers. The real no, engineers, no, I mean, my father left school at 14. He was an engineering worker. That didn't mean he was an engineer. No, that's right. That's right. And But I always felt quite ostracised, and, and my family still take the mickey out of me now. <laughs> and I don't think it advanced my life in any way. It just made me talk a little bit differently from them. And, uh, I mean, what do you think is the reason why Maggie May is, uh, is intent on taking us back to that sister? Um, I should imagine so that she can, because we're running out of brains um, and we're not educating anyone anymore unless, well, we are educating uh, privately quite well and in some state schools teachers have a huge ambition to educate people and those teachers that are good and want to educate people will be successful in doing that wherever they are. In, in whatever part of the country they are. But I think that, um, you know, they're, 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 it's getting so that it's like the royal family, you know, they're inbred. <laughs> <laughs> well, we better not go down that road too far. <laughs> Lizzie, thanks not. for we that call. I, I've got to say, though, Liz, uh, I don't accept this picture that has been painted tonight that Britain is a stupid country. If we were a stupid country, then we would not have the many good things that we do have, even though they are increasingly under threat. We would not be the fifth richest country in the world. Uh, our uh, our uh, stock market would not be at the highest it's been for very, very many uh, years. We have an enormously huge number of skilled and talented and hard-working people. I don't believe that we are stupid. We could be much more. We could be much better. We could be really, really world-class if we had a government that was ready to invest in that. This government proposal takes us in entirely the wrong direction. That's my point. Lizzie and Gloucester, thanks very much. For joining me, Aidan Bradley says, What a choice for the free world. A certifiable clown or a scheming sociopath. Bravo, America. Very well put. Uh, Simon uh, Brian Ander says, There's no shortage of brilliance from our schools. The problem is there is no shortage of forgotten, ignored kids. That's true. Stephen Carey, if this country carries on at this rate, it will become more and more divided. Corbyn must be voted in. David Stevenson sent a message which says, George, do you think that with the suspension of the Labour Party constituencies that the right wing will attempt to get compliance supporters to be sent, I presume, though it's lost, uh, to conference? I think it's uh, over. And that's what I think. Of course, Everybody's got to vote, but I think the revolt is over. Uh, Terry Clark says, we still sell arms to Saudi Arabia, uh, who conducted its own investigation into war crimes and found itself 
innocent. The British Parliament, by the way, is about to uh, have a select committee report which recommends that the government uh, stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia because those arms are being used for internal repression and external aggression. There's a rear guard action, though, being fought inside the select committee uh, by people, I can only put it this way, who are creatures of the arms dealing industry. And I refer in particular to the so-called uh, Labour MP, John Speller, who is uh, described as uh, someone who fights for the interests of the weapons industry. And Crispin Blunt, the chairman of the select committee uh, in uh, the first place, both of these are fighting a rear guard action in defense of arms dealers, even when it is abundantly clear that Saudi Arabia is one of the darkest, if not the darkest, tyranny on the earth that crucifies, and I mean crucifies, I mean literally nails to a cross, those guilty of asking for democracy in their country. Saudi Arabia is a country that has decapitated in public, on television, more people in 2016 than ISIS. Saudi Arabia is a country where women are forbidden to drive motor cars or to step foot on the pavement outside their house without the accompaniment of a male relative. Saudi Arabia is a country where you get thrown into a dungeon and tortured, quite possibly to death, for entertaining ideas like freedom, liberty, democracy. Saudi Arabia is a country that invades its neighbours. It has invaded Bahrain using British weapons. It has invaded Yemen using British weapons. It is sending British weapons to the ISIS and Al-Qaeda armies in Syria. Now, that's not a country that we should be doing business with. And I don't care if it costs the arms dealers an arm and a leg, metaphorically, if we ban them from selling weapons to these tyrants, because there are hundreds of thousands of people have lost their arms and their legs as a result of the policies of these tyrannies. So, let me go on. Enrico Tortolano, what a wonderful name, says Hillary Clinton is a threat to peace and prosperity everywhere. Malcolm Hurst says, of course, the Americans armed the Taliban to fight the Russians. That went well. And Malcolm Finch says, you're right, George, Theresa May is the iron loony. Will kids who fail the 11 plus be put to work up chimneys? <laughs> That's a very good point to end on. It's been marvelous uh, for me. I hope it was also for you. From now on, for me, she is Maggie May. 